Talking about next episodes in Scrum, I, I, I think we should dive into this. I think we should dive into this episode right here and a little bit of Vault Warden. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Our, our provocatively titled episode, Living as an Inmate. Yeah. You want to explain that? <laughs> Sure, sure. I, I, I think I think I owe us an explanation. And actually, this is even a little bit out of context, because initially when I was setting up this episode, going over our documentation uh, for Vault Ward, it fell under the, the, the two topics I'm going to cover now fell under the everyday usage category. And I was like, well, every day you're living life with it and, and you're living it right. with a, a warden. And I'm still not sure if I want to call it Bit Warden or Vault Warden, depending. Uh, that's something TBD. But it's going to be a warden nonetheless. And you know who has wardens every day. So I'm figuring we're either way, either, either way, uh, Jack and I have agreed to live as inmates in the Vault, vault Warden or Bit Warden. I'm going to call it Vault Warden <laughs> Ecosystem. I did want to go over several things uh, about it, though. And this is mainly front-end stuff, so this isn't going to change depending on which verbiage we, we end up using. Um, if you're coming to us from the future and you say, what is this Vault Warden thing you're talking about? Just, we're talking about Bit Warden. And, <laughs> and if you're like, what is this Bit Warden thing you're talking about? We're talking about Vault Warden. <laughs> so... Um, if you're not already thoroughly confused, let's go ahead and dive into the rest of this. So I have two two pages here uh, to go over. And the pages are about the application interface. Today we're going to take a look at the desktop and the mobile space when it comes to Bitboard. Uh, we're mainly going to be discussing how we access this Bolt Warden and how we display Bolt Warden to users, right? And the first thing I'm going to go over is the desktop. So most of us are comfortable with desktop applications, uh, sure. even though I'd, I'd say I probably use uh, mobile applications, probably not as much, but there are some that I, I use only on, on uh, mobile. But there sure. are there's definitely always going to be a soft spot, spot in my heart for desktop applications and i i just think it's going to be uh easier for the uh, until really augmented reality comes becomes a thing and then it's just going to be some kind of like virtualized desktop right so right. there's always going to be some kind of large scale interface right but it's it's notably different currently on desktop than it is on the mobile space so i wanted to, to address them separately uh, first, the, the desktop here has several different ways to access Bitwarden, uh, and I'll just go over those here. So the first way is through the web app. Uh, I have written here, in its most basic form, there is a web app that users can log into with their browser. And it's exactly how you would look, expect it to look. You know, you have an email address and you have a master password prompt, right? So you put in what amounts essentially to your username and password and you log into it like sure. you would log into any other web service. Right? Sure. Plain for, you know, straightforward, simple. Uh, and as a, as a practical way to implement this, I mean, this is most handy as a bookmark in a web browser uh, or for accessing on public or otherwise non-typical devices. So if I have yeah. to borrow someone's computer or if I want to access it in, in a public computer or whatever where I, I'm not using it on my cell phone or I don't have my own personal laptop on it, but I need yeah. to get to my passwords, right? This is 99% of the the way that I would access it away from those devices. I, I, I was going to say, I'd put myself in that same boat there. I all I know there's the plug-in, which you're going to go over the add-on, um, but honestly, it... I don't know why I do this. I always end up going to my own site to pull passwords down. I don't know what it is. I don't know what. I, maybe I've just trained my trained my brain to you do that do it that way. Um, but I I have a Bitwarden tab open on my browser almost all the time. Oddly enough, and I just have to. I just jump back. I just end up jumping back to it. Fair enough. And and like I mean, we were talking about last episode. You know, searching for those entries is fairly trivial so it's it's yeah. not difficult i although i do think you lose a couple things and and we're going to go over that here when i talk about the 
add-on uh, in in desktop, but it's a it's a perfectly viable way to to work. Um, I have here as a note that uh, I think this is the best place to perform administrative functions, such as yeah. manipulating folders and organizing groups. I think those are best done through the web app or the the desktop application because it's a similar layout but the the web app is going to give you exactly what you need and it's it's way more spelled out for you in one page whereas if you go through the add-on or the mobile or whatever it's going to be a lot more compact and therefore stuff is going to be hid behind different menus and this kind of lays everything out in front of your face so um, i think if you need to do a whole lot of creating new folders or different organizational stuff. I think it's, it's easiest to go through the web app application. Um, now I did want to make a note here and, and this may be relevant to you since you love to have this open, you pre- kind of prefer this. Yeah. Uh, we're always talking about defense in depth, right? So it's, it's good to keep in mind, you know, what, what is my threat vector here? Right. So I say that, while a compromised server cannot access your encrypted information, right? What's stored on disk is a blob, uh, for lack of better terminology. Uh, it is able to modify the web app code that it serves to your browser. Uh, the concern would be potentially injecting malicious code, right? So if something does get on your server, it doesn't matter because they can't decrypt anything. Like we said, everything's on client side, but what they can change say they have full permissions and they could they just have the run of the land the the first thing that they would be looking at doing is uh injecting malicious code into the web app that's being served to your browser sure uh so that's why personally i would say it's recommended to use platform native implementations such as the browser add-on or desktop or mobile client because those clients aren't served by the self same server that's holding your data. Yeah. Whereas the web server is serving you that front end brand new every single time. Talking about defense in depth, that's yeah. just one thing to That's a consider. great point to bring up. Therefore, let's talk about the browser add on. And I, I I will say I linked to Bitwarden's documentation on almost every header in this documentation because they're their docs are fabulous, right? I mean, just just really, really good. So I wanted to to do that before I, you know, kind of wrote down anything myself, uh, and and have more of a, a personal take when when talking about this stuff for for us. So I say this is where the application really shines. Talking about the browser add-on here, it brings together all the aspects that you would want in a password manager, including autofill, new login creation, and of course, random password genera- generation. Uh, the add-on button, I have a little screenshot of, uh, in case you were unaware of what it looked like, uh, and talking about how it will indicate with a pop-up number whether it has an autofill match for the site in the current tab. So the number one use case here is autofill. And sure. this is just super straightforward and easy. I mean, it'll pop up, hey, I think I have a password for this. And you click it, and it fills in your username and password for you. Now, there's also an option to have it auto-fill and auto-login at the same time. But I, I don't have that turned on. I just say, just let me know if there's an option to, to log in. Uh, now, clicking on that button will actually bring up a minimized version of the web app. Uh, which looks very similar to the mobile app. I think it's actually the same kind of code base Um, and allows you to perform almost all functions that you would need to consume the service. Um, Like I said before, the the web app is still the best place to access the more advanced functionality. So the autofill on the uh, add-on, hop in right over to that because that is the killer feature here, is, is straightforward. For every login, there's a field named URI that accepts one or more entries. This allows the browser to determine which logins are for which site. Once that has been populated, the entry will show up in the tab section of the pop-up, right? So what's most important in order for Nextcloud to figure out what site it's on and what is an appropriate password for that site is for you to have already specified, hey, for this site, I want you to give me this password. Now, 
if you're retrofitting or importing uh, another another password management tool and, and importing it into Bitwarden, say KeePass, right, you might not have that field filled out. Uh, in which case, you can still pull down that uh, add-on uh, pop-up window, and you can search your vault just like you would search it anyways. Um, and then also at that point, it, when you auto or when you log in, and you don't have it saved in Bitwarden, Bitwarden will say, "Hey, it'll it'll drop down a little banner across the top of your web page and say, "Hey, do you want me to save this password for you?" Right. And at that point, then you can say yes, and you can have it saved in Bitwarden via that add-on. Now, that doesn't help me when I'm logging into these ephemeral instances that you and I create for testing purposes. Like right. you're getting that pop-up over and over and over yeah. again. But for like when I'm logging into a brand new site or using one that I didn't have the URI for before, it says, hey, you know, do you want to... Do you want to make sure you don't have to go through the hassle of searching for it again? I was like, well, it's not much hassle, but still, it's still worth it to right. to add it on there. Auto auto fill it for me, yeah. So I do have a screenshot of what that looks like uh, with all of my usernames blurred out, of course. But the the page is our Nextcloud login for our compositional enterprise instance, um, and you can see uh, that I'm able to select through a variety of logins, right? Because I have several different logins for this same URL. Um, now you can tweak the matching rules. You can say, hey, I want all the base URL or I want only this specific thing that's right. in the URI field to match. Um, and and it, it gives you a way to say, you know, if I only want city.com slash login to present that to me, I can do that. Or I can just have anything in my uh, Bitwarden that matches city.com to pop up as well. Uh, now, note that this does not work for cards. Uh, the cards functionality functionality does not have a URI feature. Uh, interestingly enough, by default, and we'll go over this in the settings episode, but by default, it the pop-up will actually show you cards underneath all the login on your tab, right? So it'll just list all of your cards. And just say whatever you want. Uh, I have that disabled here because you can only you can see this is only the logins for the services that we have running on the, our R Compose instance. So any questions so far? Because I, I I know that you said you don't run with the the add on, and for me this is like I do the have the add on. I it. have it there. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I'll tell you what though. I don't know what happened. So right now it's showing nine plus on Bookstack right now. I think it's because of the. Uh, you mentioned it. The effect. What do you, would you say? The ephemeral. Uh, all everything related to the compositional enterprises instances, and it just saves. And I think I have about twenty here. I'm scrolling through them. Thirteen. There it is, right at the top there. As well, you know, there. You can set it so it matches rcompose.com, which is all of our instances out right. there. Right. Or you can have it so that only the compositional enterprises rcompose.com entries match. Right. right? So there are plenty of different ways to tweak, tweak that, that using those yeah. matching rules. I'm going to have to go through and update that because it is, it's actually for our subdomain and I have a, or for our, you know, main, not top level, but our domain. Uh, and then I think there is like, you know, a handful out there that are similar where it's, you know, a galore of uh, instances. So I got two more to go over here for desktop uh the the third obviously is the desktop client the native client uh, there are native client for all major operating systems um i guess the one thing that's that's cool here is that it's c probably going to be the easiest for you to work with offline now to be fair your browser add-on if you have that is also going to be cached offline so either way is going to work for you if you're not connected to the internet because your your passwords are cached. Obviously they're not syncing, but they're cached. So you can you can always use them offline, um, except for the web app, which is obviously a web app and doesn't work offline. Right. Go figure. Uh, the the other cool thing that I saw about uh, desktop clients, if you have uh, biometric locks, 
um, you can, or, or biometrics on your yeah. computer, like a fingerprint yeah. uh, reader or something like that, you can use those uh, as an alternative for re-entering your password to unlock it. So I know in my on my Mac for work, uh, I use my password to unlock my computer all the time. It's just super efficient. So being able to unlock Bitwarden with that same thing is also going to be nice. Say that again. Say, sorry about that. Say that again. So you use your, do you use a biometric for your, uh, to log into your Mac or do you use password? I use just biometrics. To, I okay, use my fingerprint. Okay. 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 I just want to come make sure. Yeah. Cause I think you yep. said password there, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. So I, I use, I use my fingerprint to log into my Mac and it would be nice to log into my password manager using the same, same thing way. Right. On desktop. Same yeah. Kind of security that yeah. I don't need. Yeah. Um, now, if you're not comfortable with that, then fine. Use the master password. Sure. Um, I also believe you can use a combination of the two if need be. I like it. Um, there's also ways to do two-factor, right? I, I don't dive into that because I'm not even sure if we're able to provide that. But you, that is something that you That's can out take there. a look into. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if it's something you're interested in, yeah, we can, we can look into that as well. Uh, but the last interface here is the command line client, which was most interesting to me. And... Specifically because this is was the basis of the code I pulled in order to interact with the, the API. So there is an official CLI client, which is the Bitwarden's official CLI that's yeah. linked there. And that has plenty of different functions and you know can do this and that and the other thing and yada yada. But what it can't do is it can't initialize an administrative user on the server. What do you mean? Oh, okay, I got you. So if you spin up a blank instance, it's not going to be able to create a user with an email and a password, basically. Exactly. I yeah. gotcha. For whatever reason or whatever requirement I had, it, it, it didn't meet that, right? So um, it's great for day-to-day kind of thing, but it didn't work for my use case. And, and obviously, that's what you're going to probably want to use if you're going to script anything. Uh, but the alternative implementation that I found on GitHub was the one that right now is quote unquote unmaintained or do they say unmaintained or like undeveloped because these, I saw it like the last update to it was like three months ago or something like that. Um, but the, <laughs> the update for 2020, I, I love it here. He's like, it seems people still care about this code. Oddly enough, <laughs> when I wrote this, the official CLI client didn't exist. I'm curious why people are using or wanting to use this over the Bitwarden official CLI since it exists now. I don't currently use the code anymore, but it's still maintained ish, I guess. I still accept PRs anyways, but I don't actively work on this code anymore. So I'm like, all right, that's cool, <laughs> you know? And uh, it it works uh, for when I tried it out, I was able to, to get the demo up and running with an instance that I had set up and I used the underlying primitives in order to set up the token generation that I needed uh, to interact with the Bitborn API yeah. upstream. Uh, so that was, that was really fun to do. Obviously it's, I, I love tinkering that way, but uh, I was, I, I use that as the basis. So if anyone needs to dive into what's actually exposed, that is a great resource. Just reading through that code. Um, if you have the need to, that should get you everything that's necessary. And you can you can see in code, in very plain and simple Python code, really, what those primitives actually are, like how you're generating these hashes and how you're generating these, you know, uh, encrypted blobs and stuff like that. So it's it's pretty cool. I was I was excited to to dive into that. And that's how you said you got down in the nitty gritty of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I do link to my own script there as well, too, if you want to see some very, very hacky uh, Python there. And this is to, uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, this is to generate the user, though, right? This generates different uh, parameters we need. So it, it generates the master, pa- master password hash and the protected key in order to pass those to the server. So using those two things, we can manipulate the API to create that login for that, us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, that and I think the email as well. Um, and the 
uh, key, key the the KDF iterations, which is um, the amount of times it runs through the the algorithm. You can see all these print statements just you just just yeah just littering this code just comment it out and you know it was actually pretty fun to to print those out by one by one and say okay this gets turned into that gets turned into the other thing and you know it gets stretched and padded out and you know the the mac key and you generate the symmetric key and just just going through all these these yeah. crypto primitives that i've forgotten about you know for for several years kind of all coming back and then, then grabbing that and iterating over it, you know, as as many times. And and I think actually in the, so it was, it was odd. In the Bitwarden CLI, that is maintained ish. Yeah. They only iterate like ten thousand times, and this iterates a hundred thousand times. And what ended up happening is. They're consistent internally. Like I said, Bitwarden just kind of holds the blob on the back end and provides a, a pretty yeah. little API in order to access it. Well, what happened is the web vault iterated over it 100,000 times. Right? And the Bitwarden CLI that was maintained ish only iterated it over 10,000 10, times. Yeah. So it was internally inconsistent when I created it with the CLI and went to log in with the web vault. Because the web vault client says I'm going to iterate this a hundred thousand times yeah. in order to get the 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 hash of, of whatever I need to, to log in, and the the CLI says every time I log in I'm only iterating fifteen thousand times yeah. or, or yeah. ten thousand times or whatever, so I could never get it to log in with the web vault because the web vault was doing it differently. So I had to dig down into that as well to figure out okay what params this is passing. Oh these are different. Oh I need to fix it. So that was that was a, a mind bender in itself. Oh, I'm sure. I can imagine like your you know the parameters for the server and the basically client are mismatched causing that problem. Now, if Bitwarden never goes back and says, "Hey, we're upgrading these to all log in with different, you know, number of iterations," then it will break the existing functionality right. on, on instances. Um because the, the clients, you know, that's not the web vault that's served with the server unless you pin the clients at a specific version. Those clients are still going to be iterating at a different uh, I- integer right. than right. than the the other client created. So it's it's interesting. Once again, the server really doesn't have any say in the process. It just kind of sits there and says, I found it or I didn't find it. You know, just to, it's a very interesting implementation and I'm, I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy with it. Um, so after having really got my hands dirty there, um, I was really happy to see that mobile just works, right? Sure. And there's a lot of really good stuff with mobile that I like here. You know, um, it, it is pretty much the same, I'd say, as a browser add-on. It's meant to be used uh, as a as a client. You know, it, it's yeah. not necessarily best for performing administrative functions. Sure, right. right. Um, one of the things I found out is that for your own protections, the mobile apps don't let you take screenshots. <laughs> so, really, yeah. How about that? Okay. Okay. On Android, at least, it blocked the screenshotting functionality. Yeah. So you don't do something stupid, like take a screenshot of your password. Or, you know, in this case, you know, a, a instructional video on how to walk through it now. I'm glad I got the camera now because now I, I can't record my phone yeah. <laughs> walking through a login because it's going to be blocked. So that was that was an interesting thing to, to figure out. Um uh, and, and actually, I wanted to take a picture for the unlock options, and I'll get there in a second. But something notable that, you know, besides the installs for Apple and Android, like you would be used to it on the App Store and the Google Play Store, respectively, for Android, the application is also available in the F-Droid repos. Nice. So since yeah. Bitwarden is and will continue to be open source which is the reason why I was able to hack around the code in the first place, it is actually able to be put into the Afteroid repos. Now, it there's additional functionality that's required there, but uh, there is a way to 
to get it into F Droid. Um, now, this is an interesting component of F Droid. I don't think we've ever talked about it, but F Droid is a client, much like we're talking about right now with a with a Bitwarden client, that can access multiple servers. So Bitwarden can or F Droid, excuse me, can actually go out to different repositories and grab packages from different repositories. For instance, I have one of my repositories pointed to the mobile Kali Linux yeah. repository. So I get a whole lot of hacking and cracking tools from there. Not that I use them, but I, they're I'm there available. if I need them. Yeah. Matrix maintains their development builds on their separate re- repos of Element. And I think one of their other mobile clients as well. As well, uh, similarly, Bitwarden has a mobile app repository for their Bitwarden client uh, on on Android mobile. So um, I'm able to add that repository to my F-Droid client on my cell phone and say, hey, I'm going to point to this repo. Please grab the Bitwarden package from this repo. And they do that for several reasons but one of the things is if you want to get onto the official F-Droid repos F-Droid itself has to be able to compile your code and it has sure. to be able to compile it in a certain way and I'm not sure if they just like didn't want to do that and just said well we'll just maintain our own repo then and just make it available to anyone who wants to add our repo and F-Droid is like yeah sure whatever you can point to your own repo and that's that's fine but to get onto there built-in, out-of-the-box repo, I, I think they have to build your package itself. For, so. yeah. yeah. I thought that was interesting, at least, but, the, you know, it's it's awesome. I love open-source software, and I love seeing it being used like this exactly the way it was supposed to be in a federated-type manner. Now, talking about unlock options, though, uh, when you dive into actually using the application itself, for the initial login... Uh, your master password is, of course, required as it generates the data necessary to retrieve your passwords. Right? Sure. However, after the initial login, you have the option of unlocking the application simply with your biometrics or your phone's PIN. Uh, so if you're on Apple, I would assume that it works with a facial login recognition, right? So for me, it takes a uh, full password every time. Uh, I, th- I don't Do know. Do you if not you have could- it set up? I that might that could be part of it. I have not looked into it. Uh, to tell you the truth, usually I do not. I am not a frequent flyer of Bitwarden on mobile. Uh, I don't really it's, find myself using it all that often. And if I do, it's just end up putting in the master password and using well, it that and, way. And yeah, that's that's easy enough. I might have you do the settings episodes so we can we can have you dive into some of these things. See it, yeah, uh, but. You know, I I say it's recommended to set it to one of the above since it would get extremely tedious to continuously be required to insert your master password every time that you want to autofill a login, right? Sure. So, once again, up to you. It's it's the same argument as the desktop client, right? If you feel that you are sufficient, you know, sufficiently protected, um, go ahead and and make it a biometric because it's it's going to be a lot easier. Um, at least that's my take on it. Now. I use it for the autofill, and I have uh, just a screenshot here of me logging into mobile eBay, uh, and it prompts me for my password. And uh, the autofill will pop up uh, if you enable it in the settings. So once again, something else to look forward to. Uh, The following prompt pops up whenever you click on a password field. This is an example like I have here of logging into eBay on a mobile browser. So yeah. After clicking on the password field, it just literally pops up autofill with Bitwarden. Yeah. You know, and yeah. clicking on that will actually take me to the application um, where I can select the uh, password, password to autofill yeah. it will. Yep. Um, keep in mind that the autofill follows all the rules of the browser add-on, right? So if it's not there by URI. Gotcha. Um, also, Android at least, and I'm sure Apple is the same way, it has an internal identifier for different applications. So like... I've noticed like I can open up a an application, right? And if I've logged out of it and I go to log into it, it will say, you know, com dot application yeah. dot name, right? Um is is not found in your, your vault. I'm like, well yeah, because that's for this other service right. that is obviously not, you know, 
um, that's not the URI, but it it can also store its internal URI if you need to. Now, as you know, I mean, when you're on your phone, you're not usually logging out and logging into applications. Usually, it, you log in and you just leave it. Saves it, leave yeah, it sure, in. yeah. So at that point, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you're doing stuff like I, I access a, a lot of things through my mobile browser, right? And I clear out the, the cookies out of there like I would on my desktop browser, right? So that doesn't sort of log in history. So every time I go back, I have to re-log in and Bitwarden handles that for me, right? Uh, but just just knowing that I don't have to open it on my desktop and manually type it into my phone is pretty reassuring. Well, they have the clipboard too. I know that's kind of what's available on mobile for iOS that I've kind of used, which is just standard across the board. Two-factor works that way, that same way. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of different ways. I also linked the documentation of mobile up here. You know, they go through all that more. Um, to the the bitwarden.com I had something real quick here i actually went through this past week i think it was after i think it was monday after we last talked um and i had went through and i had updated all my one-time passwords for to use bitwarden instead of a phone yeah 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 so i'm excited about that i was really happy to get a lot of those moved and it, it was a total pain um but <laughs> oh yeah yeah for the most part they are now off my phone which was what I would describe as a single point of failure there. <laughs> Absolutely. So now I have, Absolutely. you know, I am pretty good about my backups for um, Bitwarden and everything. And I know if we have, you know, if you sign up for an instance at our compose, we have, we do backups and all that as well. So, you know, you don't have that single point of failure with the phone. Yeah. And this way there's no excuse not to do two factor. Right. And right. along with a password manager, and in ad block, I mean, two factor auth is going to yeah. be on the top five security recommendations. You know, I'd say probably keep keep your software updated. Um, use a password manager. Use two factor. You know what else? HTTPS. I don't know if that's a good one. That's kind of forced on you anymore, but. Don't give your password to anybody for any reason. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> people do <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's in my top five, but you know, <laughs> we'll leave a top three, right? <laughs> Definitely a top.